everybody, before we jump into this podcast, we brought on one of our good friends, Parachute Packing American Gabe Asias. He came on and talked about all things AFE and working those special warfare mission support. Do you need support? This is my try to Trent segue. Do you need support wow. during your day? Namely from caffeine, go and check out Cardomax. So Cardomax.com, they've been our partner for a long time. Sean Matson runs Cardomax over there. He's awesome. We got the energy intensifier. Trent, I've made this joke a million times. I don't know how many of these packets you can take in in a day, but I know how many I've seen you take in in a day. And it's usually around like seven. Like you are just, you're visualizing sounds some of the times with the Cardomax packet. So, um, but the energy intensifier isn't the only thing that they have. They've also got their Hydromax. So put those two things together. You're gonna be hydrated as fast as you possibly can. They're small, the packages are super lightweight. You can just throw them in any water or any sports drink that you got going and poof, you got a little energy on the on, on the go. So go over to Cardomax.com, throw our code in, one's ready at checkout, get yourself a sweet discount and check out everything that they're doing. You can follow them on Instagram as well. Just look for Cardomax. So once again, use our code ONES READY at checkout to get yourself some sweet energy from cardomax.com. See, I would have just said that they work a ton of hours supporting us because we're a bunch of morons. And that way <laughs> they need they need to be hydrated. They need the, the caffeine and That's all that true. other stuff. That's true. And, and, and things that uh, other things that help you like push through those 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 days when you're, you know, working 12, 24 hour shifts fitness, yep. right? You got to you got to have the caffeine maybe for the emergencies, but also being fit. Do we know anybody that knows anything about fitness and jujitsu and growing sweet gray beards? Oh, and see, now you courses. play gray beards. I had I had no idea who you were talking about until you hit the gray beard and then poof, right in my head, Kevin Edgerton over at 18 Alpha Fitness. So Kevin has a bunch of programs out there. We were talking just before we got on. I'm definitely going to go through his uh, kettlebell for uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu program here. He's got stuff for everybody and it's not just people that are looking to go through the pipeline. But oh, by the way, if you want to go through any assessment selection and all the way through your career with a good, stable battle chassis, Kevin Edgerton is the one to do it. So go check him out over at 18 Fitness. Use the code one ready at checkout and that'll get you a sweet discount on his stuff. So that's the number one and then ready all caps with 18 Alpha Fitness. Anything that you want to do and you don't even have to be somebody that's looking to do Aspect War. Like, hey, it's, you know, about to be March. Did you have a New Year's resolution that you're like, oh man, I did, I'm not getting to the gym as much as I possibly can. Kevin will help you get back on track. He provides video coaching, one-on-one -on -one advice, and the dude is a 100% bona fide badass. He's been an 18 uh, series guy. He retired as an officer out of there and then worked in the special uh, operations pipeline for us, the special warfare pipeline. So he has seen it all from, you know, straight up nobody that's, uh, you know, ever trained before in their life and they just want to get a little bit more fit or maybe you're a jujitsu athlete all the way up to you want to be selected for army special forces or, or marines so kevin edgerton is awesome go check him out at 18 alpha fitness yeah and now on to this uh sweet podcast with gabe Light yeah, up. so so sweet what's up everybody welcome back to the ones ready podcast back here in the team room we got a special one for you this week We've started to bring in some other people from other AFSCs that we wanted to talk to that support rescue, that support ST. And today we brought back one of my favorite dudes. He's literally saved my life, Gabe Macias. What's up, my dude? Hey, what's up, guys? How's everything going? Man, it's going great. So just for everybody out there that doesn't know who you are, just talk about how it is that you got into the Air Force. Sure. Yeah. So I'm Gabe Macias. I joined uh, after going a couple of years of high school. I uh, didn't know what I was going to do. Didn't know what I was going to do in the military. Um, just went open general uh, and then got picked up for survival equipment. Um, my recruiter kind of lied to me, told me I was going to work with cool shit, uh, NVGs, parachutes. Uh, <laughs> I was going to test cool weapons. And I was like, man, this sounds awesome. So, uh, so wait a second. Yeah. So for, for y'all that don't know, open general, you just be able to you used to be able to just go to the Air Force and be like, I don't know what I want to do. I'm just going to come in. And they would literally just put you in a big pool and you would come in and then they would just sort of like give you a job. Yeah. So he told you you were going to test cool weapons. Yeah. He said survival equipment's full of cool weapons and you got to do all this cool shit. And I was like, man, yeah, that sounds <laughs> awesome. I didn't know that was a job. but So <laughs> nobody, nobody did. We didn't either. Yeah. As a matter, yeah. So uh, I got to tech school and uh like block one, you learn, you know, random things, how to use a TO, safety stuff. And block two, they sat me in front of a sewing machine and I was like, dude, what is going on here? <laughs> like, this is not what I signed up for. And, uh, you know, my instructor had to sit me down and he's like, hey, man, like we work with parachutes. This is super important. Like, so kind of changed my mindset a little bit and, uh, you know, finished tech school, went to uh, Edlin where I worked on uh, uh, emergency bailout parachutes, the ACEs too, and 
that stuff. Went to Korea, did the same thing. And uh, I really got my start when I went to England. Uh, we would augment for the 321st SDS. Mm-hmm. So that's where I learned how to pack uh, uh, the old MC4s. And uh, they would bring them down to us. And we would uh, they would bring us brand new ones. And uh, we'd put them in service. And that's where I learned how to do all that stuff. And um, my superintendent uh, at the time was a really good guy. So he sent me to a uh, red flag out at Nellis to pack some more parachutes out there. And it's kind of where I got my start. So, uh, yeah. Fantastic. So tell, tell everybody exactly what is aerial flight equipment or survival equipment or whatever. So just describe the general AFSC. So you came in over general, you didn't know what you, you wanted to do. Your recruiter did a solid job by you and just told you that you were going to essentially be Jason Bourne in the sky. Yeah, so basically. shout out to whatever recruiter that was. Yeah. Test weapons, uh, you know, jump from the highest heights, dive to the to deepest steps, stuff like that. Um, so what is AFE exactly? And what, what job do you guys have uh, in the Air Force? How do you support like the larger Air Force? And, you know, start us off too. We'll, we'll talk about ST and rescue here in a second, because that's a, a whole different beast. But, you know, when you're going to tech school, what are, what are the basics that you learn as a, a, an AFE troop? So when I first came in, I came in as survival equipment and they also had uh, another career field called life support. And uh, about three years into my career, they merged the two. So um, going through tech school, uh, it's kind of different from, it's a lot different now than it was back then. Now they have uh, 12 weeks and you learn anything from pilots to emergency bailouts to uh, uh, like flotation type gear and stuff like that. Um, But now they're going to go into two tracks. So you're going to have a fighter pilot track where you uh, learn how to do all the gear on the fighter. And then a heavy track where you learn how to do everything on heavies and guardian angel ST are falling into the, uh, uh, heavies track. So I'm not really sure what tech school is going to look like, but it's probably, uh, going to be about the same where you learn all the basics and then you just learn on the job training where whenever you go to your first base. So. They threw us in with the heavies. They did. We don't even like rate to be with the fighter pilots. No, nope. yeah, you guys aren't cool enough. Yeah. No offense to heavy pilots. <laughs> yeah. All the offense to heavy pilots. How dare you? How dare you? Gee, the bus drivers, they love it. <laughs> so, so it was it was definitely harder when you went through, right? Like how, how many months did you spend in tech school? You're saying they're doing like 12 weeks now and then they, they flush out. But like yeah. when you went through, what was it? So we would do, uh, so it was 13 weeks when I went through. And then now you have the... Uh, three different phrase, phases you got to go through Fort Lee. So you got phase one, phase two, and phase three. Um, so phase two and three are three weeks each at Fort Lee. And then you got to go back at a later time to learn cargo. And that's phase one. And that's usually about three weeks as well. So it's a lot of training to be a rigor. Um, additional training just in regular Air Force tech school. Right. Uh, how much, like, to, the, to this point in your career, how much time have you spent training? I know I'm, I'm jumping ahead and I need to get back to like being in order, but not, it's just a, a curious because I'm going to go back to it. How, how much time have you spent training to, to do what you do now to be the, the expert that you are? I'm assuming you're the expert because you got invited onto the podcast. Um, it takes about two years to get fully qualified and you spend about eight to nine months of that in some type of school uh, trying to figure out what you're doing and like how to do it safely and efficiently and yeah so it takes quite a bit of time yeah but i'm I'm assuming that you've hit like little training events and schools and and certifications along the way as well right yep how many of those yeah for sure um we also get the opportunity to go to like the fa master rigger school and get our uh, fa license so uh senior or master i just went straight to master um but that's that's another three weeks <laughs> right there. Blow yeah. right past that. I just, yeah, I just yeah. went straight to master. I just decided I didn't want to take all the intermediate steps, so I just went right to the end. It, was just, it seemed more efficient at the time. That's exactly what my thought process was. Quickest quickest way to get from A to B. Uh, <laughs> straight line. I'm just going to go straight. Uh, Sarge, I'd, I'd just like to test out for master right now. They'd be like, yep, you're in. No thought to ask before. I know you're an RQS now. You blend right in. <laughs> So was was the sewing the hardest thing for you when you when you were going through tech school? I mean, I, it, it was like surprising, but like, were there any big hurdles for you personally? And 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 was that the same thing that most of the people struggle with while they're in tech school? 
Uh, it is. It's uh, it's hard to just get all the timings down and actually want to sit there and do it. So it's uh, definitely a more more of a mental thing than it is really anything. Like, man, why the hell am I sitting here selling? Like, I could be doing something something cooler. Literally that, anything you know? else. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it was more of a mental thing. But once you get over that, um, it's not it's not too difficult. It's just finding a balance. And uh, I had a great instructor, um, and he helped me get over all those barriers and showed me a lot of cool techniques. And, uh, yeah, so definitely helped me out when I became a a master rigger. And when you do that, you sew a lot, a lot of things on parachutes and patches and lines and harnesses and all of this stuff. So all that basic training I got while I was in, uh, tech school definitely paid off later in, later in my career. Now, speaking of sewing a bunch of stuff, you get a bunch of dudes, operators that bring, bring stuff to you, whether it's their rucks or their uniforms, <laughs> yeah. go, hey, can you sew this on there? Here's a here's a six pack of monsters or whatever it oh. is, you know, whatever your drink happens to be. Hey, can you sew this on there? Because one, you guys have got the the good machines with the good needles and stuff like that and the right. material. Uh two is, you know, we'll end up putting a needle through our, our fingers and hands and stuff <laughs> like that. So it gets ugly. Yeah, yeah very cool. Um, and and three yeah. because we have operator privilege and we disrespect parachute packing Americans such as Gabe <laughs> Gabe and we're like hey oh for sure we had this dumb idea to say oh I want to listen man uh this piece of kit it's almost perfect but I need you to sew a pocket upside down so that I can put a magazine <laughs> upside down on my weak side so that I can I can grab it I don't know how many innovations the AFE shop is actually responsible for and operators are taking credit but I assume it's in the two million range oh yeah it's got to well, be somewhere there. For sure. I mean, you guys were the ones that, so, so, you know, before cry and, and the company started putting the, the pockets on the shoulders, mm-hmm. we would take our uniforms, cut, cut the bottom pockets off of the, uh, of the, uh, BDUs at the time. Cause they were, am I wrong? There were four sets of pockets. If I remember right. No. I yeah. At one point know. there were on the BDUs. I'm out there, there, were, there, were, there were four yeah. total pockets on the, yeah, there was four, four total, total pockets. Yeah. We take the bottom, we take the bottom pockets off, put them up out. on the shoulders, and then we take these pockets and cant them so that they can actually be usable. Now that's just common practice for, you know, out of the manufacturer. But um, one of the things that I think is surprising for a lot of people, is especially, and I'll, I'll go straight from, from ST and RQS, because all we know, like, in a, an RQS and an STS of AFE, as, you know, we, we think automatically MEGs, parachute packing, um, you know, rigging and that kind of stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. But in the, in the grand scheme of things, the air force AFE has got an enormous task list, if you will. Now you don't, I mean, we're talking from, yeah. um, O2 NVGs, um, harnesses for, for pilots, harnesses, for air crew, um, all the helmets, like you get the new F 35 helmets that you guys are, mm-hmm. you know, AFE is responsible for that half million dollar helmets that are custom made to the pilot. You guys are, are providing all the maintenance for those kind of things. So your technical expertise is, is so wide ranging that, that I don't think from a, from an operator standpoint, we really appreciate that or know that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's uh, so many different aspects to AFE, and uh, it's hard to be uh, like a master in all of them. You just kind of get your general knowledge and hope somebody in your shop picked it up and is, is really good at that, you know, because um, you got to learn so many different things, um, especially in the heavy and fighters world with those Jahamix helmets and uh, their O2 equipment, and then they have all of their G suits that they got to continually inspect and make sure those are safe for those dudes. So, uh, they get their blood flowing all the time. And yeah, it's just super important all around, man. Like those guys do some good, good stuff. Do you guys there. get the, do you guys get to pick that path? Not really. Like, um, you know, if, if I'm like, okay, so it's assigned to you pretty much. Um, once you get into, uh, GAST community, you can kind of pick your path and kind of keep going from, uh, unit to unit, depending on, like your skill level and if you want to keep, keep doing it. But for the most part, it's just up to the air force. Uh, we're trying to move away to that. We're trying to do shreds and give, uh, everyone who's had parachute experience or heavy or fighter experience a certain code so they can continue that path. And eventually they'll become masters in, uh, in what they do and have a little more continuity as the new generations come up. 
Yeah, it's it's one thing that when I got the Nellis because most most of the AFE on Nellis falls under the weapon school for don't I don't I don't understand why that Comrel is the way it is, but mm-hmm. Whatever. So most most of the AFE falls on the weapon school. So as I was going around visiting, seeing all the different things, because they have all different shops that handle all different things, and and seeing the intricate pieces of equipment that they are not only inspecting but providing maintenance on and packing and getting ready for the hundreds of jets that are about to fly out for red flag or, mm-hmm. or web school integration or just your everyday flights. It's it's pretty incredible. So you guys have got. Uh, uh, one hell of an important job as somebody who has had uh, two malfunctions in the past, like very, very important. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's what I started off the podcast with saying, you know, Gabe has saved my life as I've had two cutaways in my entire life. Dan Davis packed one of them for me. Shout out Dan Davis. Mm-hmm. Thanks very much. And Gabe actually packed the other one uh, yep. when we were together at the school. Yeah, I know. So let's, let's talk about how it is that you get into guardian angel and special tactics, because you guys, like you said, you know, tons of stuff that you guys are responsible for from you know fighter fighter stuff to when you get to uh, guardian angel and st you help us actually rig literally everything up like if mm-hmm. if it can fall out of an airplane and land on the ground without like without breaking the afe guys and gals in the world they're the ones that actually make that happen so how do you guys track over to guardian angel or to st so either on the acc side or, or on AFSOC? is it an application process is is it more about who you know with the career field manager? How do you guys actually get there? Um, so I started out, and it seems like um, a lot of people are starting out in an OSS type uh, type place. If you don't automatically okay. get sent to a guardian angel unit, um, you know, you just uh, work your ass off in in the uh, OSS and tell your leadership that you have uh, interest in being uh, GA or ST and be joining that type of world and. Uh, Eventually, okay. just look out for opportunities. And just, just for a second, everybody, Gabe, we're really bad with TLAs here. TLA is a three-letter acronym. Okay. OSS is an operational support squadron. It's yep. essentially like an island of misfit toys that supports literally everybody. They're yeah. supposed to be a group-level function that supports a bunch of subordinate units that reports directly to a wing, blah, blah, blah. The OSS It's a thankless is, job. It is a it thankless is. job. And it's a thankless job because all of them are super dorks. Kidding. Sorry, seer guys. That's not what I mean. Anyway. <laughs> So you're in the OSS, you're working hard, you're getting your your reps in and figuring out what it is that you want to do. And then somebody decides, all right, tight, I want to go to a, to a rescue unit. How do they get there? So uh, usually just by augmenting, going over to the rescue or ST and letting them know your intentions and uh, like, hey, I want to be here. Here's my face. Um, you guys need help with anything. Um, volunteering to go out on jumps and have a... Uh, you know, if we're doing water jumps, help uh, just pull parachutes in, you know, just be a workhorse and show you want to show you want to be part of this community and you're going to be value added. Are you telling me that as an individual, if you're proactive and you seek out opportunities, those opportunities will present themselves? This is <laughs> mind blowing. Mind-blowing. Groundbreaking yeah, know, stuff. Right? Yeah. Someone get Jocko on the phone right now. I don't think Goggins or Jocko has it. So you're saying be a good dude and put out and yeah. you're going to be able to get picked up. Yeah. Oh absolutely. my God. I'm right. not making fun of you. Know, it's all I the know. people that ask these questions like, well, how do I do this? It's like, you just go do stuff. You just, go you just do, do it. Show. You just go. What if you, yeah. you just, you just show up and then people are like, do you work here? And then every once in a while you just go, yeah, totally. I do. And then you work there. That's, mm-hmm. that's how it happens. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually uh, I've actually picked up three people from the OSS while this, I was a superintendent at the 38, just because they came over and talked to me and showed interest and came out, hung out on the DZE, and I'm like, yeah. So whenever we had an opening pop up, I'm like, that's an easy one. Like, let me just PCA you over. So yeah, local hires are the easiest for sure. Yeah. So you're an AFE troop. You've been working in the OSS and you actually, you, you bro to bro it, you go over, you're, you're a good dude or a good gal. And by the way, this is a gender neutral conversation because some of the, some of the better riggers that I've ever actually worked for have been girls. Like we have uh, females that work everywhere. Yeah. 100%. They job it out. So that first day that you show up, what are some challenges working as a, as a combat mission supporter, as we now call them special warfare mission support? What, what are some challenges working as that AFSC as that first day around all the operators? Cause it's, it's weird enough for us. Like we feel the same thing when we go to a different unit, when we show up for the first day at work, we feel some type of way about it. How was it for you that first day? Uh, it was pretty overwhelming. So, um, my first day I was actually 
at the uh, Sears Schoolhouse at the 66, 66 TRS uh, Debt 2 out in Pensacola. So that was the first chance I had to work with dudes who jumped every day. And, you know, working with the Sears guys, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of intimidating. Um, you know, it's a whole different, it's a whole different vibe from the pilots. And, um, you know, they're real interactive and they're good dudes and they want to get to know you. And in the fighter pilot world, you know, it takes a lot longer to build that relationship, mostly because you don't see them every day. You just kind of see them when they need stuff. But on an ST, uh, RQS type world, you see them constantly. So uh, it's kind of intimidating at first. And then, uh, you know, everyone was super cool. They invite you to come work out with them or go to the gym or, uh, you know, do different events or ask for help for training or, you know, just kind of stuff like that. But, you know, I really think they just wanted to get to know us because uh, they can, we can help them uh, sew different type of things up and pack their personal rigs on the side, you know. So, uh, no, but it was, Intimidating at first, but overall, it's it's pretty cool. Right. Well, I'm glad that you got to work with the Seer guys first, who are also known for sewing all of the things in their off time. So at yeah. least you guys could share your love of like uh, sewing craft and, and knitting or, or whatever that's called. Needlepoint, <laughs> yeah. making sweet pillows. Yeah, exactly. um, so as, as you started working, <laughs> as you started working there, when did it kind of hit you? Like, so we, you, you kind of already alluded to it, but I really want you to talk about it. Like, wow, I am now supporting something completely different. Like, so cool packing a packing a seat kit packing some sort of other vest and you know watching a plane fly out and then come back in it is one thing but mm -hmm. when was the first time if you remember that you were like oh wow i'm actually supporting something different when was that first time you got that good feedback that you're like wow i might be real uh, much closer to the x so to speak so that was actually i was actually at uh, mildenhall when we were supporting the uh, 321st sts and augmenting for them um, they let me come out on the drop zone and see one of the first parachutes I ever packed. And uh, one of the dudes had his uh, nice. had his uh, ruck rigged up wrong and his ruck just started falling through the sky. And uh, it was a night jump. So all I see is chem sticks falling. And I'm like, I was like, dang, I was like, damn, I, I know I did everything right on that shoot. I was like walking myself and I was like, man, I don't. <laughs> and then they tell me it was a ruck and like everyone, uh, everyone's canopy is open fine. So. I think that was the first time where I was like, all right, people are actually using my stuff and like making a difference and could possibly save lives here one day. So I think that was the first time where I was like, all right, this is the path I want to go. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, it, it's a lot. Uh, I think we've alluded to it. The The personalities that you have to deal with are difficult. You know, with, you have guys coming up to you with like just like wads of webbing and throwing it at you and being like, can you make this make something, you know, can you do something with this? Yep. <clears throat> but as you get closer to like the end result of everybody's, you know, work, right. I, I think it gets a little more clear. So did, do you deploy or anything with, uh, with those folks and, uh, or, or what do deployments look like for AFE? Do you guys go down range and, and bebop around and fix everybody's equipment that we're constantly tearing to pieces? Yeah, so uh, in the ST world, it's a little different because they don't really have a, a jump type mission. Um, so we still deploy with them. We go out and we do uh, different types of things, whatever they need us to do. Um, I did supply and work with the sauce team on one of them uh, when I was at the two three. And uh, but the uh, GA um, deployments, they jump all the time, and we take parachutes. And there's a jump mission, and uh, we got a couple of dudes deployed now who are doing awesome, awesome stuff with the uh, Marsoc and the SEALs, uh, rigging up bundles and doing some resupply type things. So uh, yeah, there's just so many opportunities. It's just, you got to go find them, you know, and make yourself marketable. So those dudes deployed now are, are killing it. And uh, Shane Bond's out there. I don't know if you guys know him, but uh, uh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So he's yep. a solid, solid rigger and he's out there leading the charge out there. So do you guys like go across the fence to like the Navy and, and Marine folks that do the job that you do and talk shit? Be like, I'll bet you one of your guys falls in and, and his shoot doesn't open. Jeez. Yeah, all the time we go and why would they like, talk? why do you dudes come in? Why do you dudes come and pick us? <laughs> no, we don't. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm just wondering, like, did, does that, I'm, I'm imagining when you saw that ruck falling, like, I, I get nervous watching other people jump because until all those those canopies are open i don't know it, it, it's something about it right like do you ever get over that like nervous energy that you have to feel knowing that you packed 
those parachutes and these idiots are jumping out of the planes and <laughs> or or do you just sort of like at a certain point be like you know it's fine it's it's good uh, i think you always have a little bit of that nervousness um it's not it's not there all the time and it's not uh, overwhelming but you always have that little bit you know, that little bit in you and I, I think that's what keeps everybody humble and making sure you're doing the right thing all the time uh, because that one time you forget you know you hope somebody's there to catch it before before anything bad happens so yeah you do have that little bit but overall it's it's not uh, overwhelming like it was that first day part of it's kind of having an appreciation for you know, the, the job that you are doing and seeing the end result. So one of the things that it, and it's taken a long time for this to happen, like the army and Navy had had this data a long time ago, it took a while for the air force to get on board with it, but sending AFE uh, folks, especially special tactics and RQS folks to jump school. Mm -hmm. um, that has been a challenge for, for many years now. And now I think we've cracked the nut uh, pretty much all ST and RQS AFE are going to airborne and then subsequently free fall, correct? Yep, that's right. Uh, ST just got all of their dudes uh, um, slot or J code slots to go to airborne. Um, RQS is working on it. They're probably about 50% right now. Um, now it's just waiting on free fall slots and actually trying to get our guys uh, to airborne. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a work in progress, but it's it's going a lot better than it has been. Yeah, and and I mean, do, I I know why I think why I think it's important. Like, do, does the AFE community that that does that? Do they they? I know a lot of them wanted to go to jump school, mm -hmm. but um, like, do you guys see the importance in it as well? Because for me, it's it's hey, you guys do the packing. I I'm kind of on the, on the business end of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes there's a long opening. That's a snivel, you know, with that, yeah. <laughs> especially with the RA ones, like there's a long opening. Um, whereas MC4s, you know, you can kind of pack it to where you get a snap opening. Yep. Um, so there's, there's different, like you guys have that art now where, you know, like, okay, well, I'm going to roll the nose a little bit and soften this opening a bit. Um, or, or not, or not. Or not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you, when you dump, when you let that shoot go, and you come out and you get a snap, little snapperoo. That's how you know you yeah. were a little bit too forward with the AFE shop, and you're like, "All right, boys, yeah. noted." A little backbreaker, yeah. little, but little, hey, I mean, how you so doing? why? Yeah. So why is that important to you guys? So I think it's important so the riggers actually know um, exactly what they do to that canopy and how they put it in the bag and how it's going to open. Uh, when I was at the when I was with the SEER guys, they were kind of my, uh, you know, my, my testers. So I'd roll the nose a little tighter and they would tell me, they would give me feedback. So, so to the point where I got my technique right. So every opening was exactly the same. So having us actually be jumpers would be beneficial because then we would know exactly how our shoot opens and how we can change our technique a little bit. So every shoot opens the same. There's no long snivels or no quick openings, you know, just kind of, open does it should yeah and and for the viewers out there the listeners uh i think it's important to know that not every shoot is the same so you could be qualified to pack an mc4 and please okay, yeah, correct absolutely. me if i'm wrong mc4 mc5 are pretty much the same shoot there's mm -hmm. some obviously container differences but that's the same certification you can't just pack an MC4 or an MC5 and then go straight on to an RA1. You still have to go to school, mm -hmm. like get that certification in that parachute. Same with the static line shoots. Like there are different shoots, you know, there's different shoots from the reserves to the actual mains and there's certification and schooling required for each one of those. Yeah, absolutely. You got to, every new parachute that comes out, there's always a new certification, especially going through the army. Um, but yeah. Tight. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. 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 So here's here's the question too. So it, it's not just about pack and parachutes, and it's not just about um, you know doing the the standard AFE job. When you're on the the ACC side of the fence, you know working at the rescue units, or mm -hmm. when you come over to AFSOC and you're working at ST, 
we expect you to do a lot of things from driving boats to playing op four. We expect you to know radios like the back of your hand. You're going to be a malfunction officer. You're going to perform a lot of different functions. How, how intense was that side of the job? And did you expect to be put almost, you know, in that direct support role when you first started working at rescue? No, absolutely not. I didn't even know those were options um, when I first got in. And, uh, you know, the operators are just so test, test saturated and they got their own thing going on. So trying to take away whatever we can from them so they could do what they need to do is, is kind of where, kind of where we go. So being boatmaster, DZCO or uh, Malfo. And now I'm working on getting support dudes, uh, rescue swimmer quals, uh, just stuff like that. So. Um, you know, it's kind of over overwhelming at first because you're trying to learn your job um, and do all of these extra things. Uh, but once you get the hang of it, once you get the flow uh, and you make yourself more marketable, you know, you go on more TDYs, uh, get on more deployments because you qualify for more more tasks. And, man, I think that's probably the best part about being in RQS and ST uh, squadrons is getting to do all that extra stuff, getting to go drive boats, being a... Um, a trainer for M razors or, uh, or generals or, you know, things like that. So, and I think yeah, uh, for a lot sure. of you guys, yeah, that's, that's their favorite part. Right. And it's something that people just don't know about. It's one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on is that, you know, we keep, we have all these buzzwords, multi-capable airmen are so hot right now yeah, exactly. saying MCA, <laughs> but that's where you've been living your life, man. Yeah. Like you, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've gotten out of the water and I look and you're, you're driving a boat and you're mm -hmm. pulling a shoot, like you specifically are pulling a shoot in and you specifically are driving that boat or, you know, we'll be doing a, you know, I distinctly remember, you know, walking around in the wilderness of New Mexico and turning around and like, you were, you were the guy that was like, oh, we just attacked you. <laughs> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that was pretty awesome. Yeah. And people don't know about it. So what, what kind of people are you looking to bring in for AFE? Cause as you know, we talked mm -hmm. to, you know, 18 to, you know, 34 year old folks that, that may not know what they want to do. And sometimes it's not just being an operator, it's working in those special warfare mission support jobs. So what kind of people are you looking to bring in to the AFE shop uh, to be, you know, multi-capable airmen and where we're going? So basically the type of people who just want to learn and um, are self-motivated. Um, uh, I think the, the biggest thing we're looking for is attitude. Like just have a good attitude. Um, don't tell me no, tell me how to get to yes type person. Um, tell me if it's yes, like what are, what are, um, what are the consequences of it? So just trying to find people like that and uh, positive attitude and like, you don't have to know everything about parachutes or know everything about uh, uh, anything really just positive mental attitude and Hey, I'm here to work. I'm here to learn. So that's kind of what we're looking for. And, um, at the RQS right now, that's the type of people that we bring over. Uh, on, awesome. On, on, and if on people screen. are going to go, yeah, if people are going to go talk to a recruiter, what, I mean, what is the actual job? Cause you came in, it was a completely different job, right? You came in at survival right. equipment. So is it all under the same banner or AFSE? It is now. So if they're going to go talk to a recruiter. They would come in as a uh, air crew flight equipment. And, uh, hopefully once they get into air crew flight equipment world, uh, if they're not automatically put into RQS or ST, because they're starting to pull at least one or two um, new guys from the, from tech school. Um, so if they're not nice. there, go to an S, go go to an OSS and you know work hard and throw your intentions out there of what you want to do, and eventually you'll get there. Right. Put out, be a good dude or a, or a good chick, and mm -hmm. then you'll find yourself working out over at the uh, at the ACC units over at the RQSs or, or out, at, out at ST. So how long is uh, how long is there a pipeline now, like start to finish? So let's say somebody wants to come in straight up off the street. They want to go knock out that pre uh, that pre training. So basic training. Got it. Yeah. You know, eight weeks down to San Antonio, Texas. Um, how long is tech school and how long what what is that that basic certification that you get coming out of tech school? So when they go to tech school, they're going to go, they're going to learn all of their basics. Um, and they just switched it all up. I think uh, FY23, they're going to implement the A shred and B shred. Uh, so fighters and heavies shreds. Um, but you're going to go, you're going to learn all your general basics, how to read a TO, hazmat, all of that good stuff, uh, safety stuff. And then you're going to pick a shred, heavies or fighters, or depending on where your assignment is. Um, so once they give you that, you'll go down that track, you'll learn 
everything you need to know for fighters, just the basics, not everything. Um, and then the same for heavies. And then you'll go to your next base. And um, that's probably going to be, I think that's 13 weeks total. So Okay. So <clears throat> for these for these folks coming out of tech school and they get a GAST right off uh, out the gate, mm-hmm. Would you say that their performance in tech school would give them more latitude to choose which route they go if they uh, if they want to do one of these things? That's what we were kind of hoping to push for uh, in tech school so we can try to find the right guys uh, while they're in school and they show that they want to be in it. But uh, it hasn't gotten that far yet. It's still in the baby steps of uh, trying to figure out how to do all of that. So eventually, hopefully, if not, it's just kind of, you know, best of luck. Here you go. Yeah. No. And, and, and talking about these shreds, I, I think it's, it, it's, it might be interesting for people to know these are not like AFE is not pushing uh, by themselves to get these shreds to like get coded to mm-hmm. stay in, in GA or ST when you, when it's, it's hard to explain how uh, valuable someone like you, you, you know, like you are when you, you get on a team, you get to a, a an STS or, a, or RQS and like we, we find those people that fit. Like GA and ST isn't for everybody. Like there's a reason that we're talking about codes and picking the right people and, 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 and all this other stuff, because some people don't fit, but like you find that person and we invest in them and they invest in us. And it's like, why can't we keep this person in the community? And it's really frustrating when you have that person that wants to stay, that has all these qualifications, very specific to what we do. And then, you know, big blue air force, AFPC comes in and it's not their fault. It's just math. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're like, no, like for career progression, like you have to go over here and, and work with these like, you know, F-16 pilots or whatever. And you're like, and it just, it crushes everybody. It's and, so and frustrating. So like, yeah. It, what does it take? It takes almost a year and a half to get somebody fully trained. Like, you, you know, you're already an AFE guy or gal. You come over to the ST. I think it's taking us almost a year and a half to get people to where they're fully qualified. They can pack without somebody over their shoulder. Um, and that's the reason why we're talking about, you know, we're talking about nerdy stuff because we know what we're talking about here, but basically what we want to do is we want to, we want to bring you in and provide you this training and then protect you from going anywhere else. And yeah, like Trent said, there's challenges with how do we, you know, what, what are you supposed to do once you get to that E6 sort of range, you have to go run a shop somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You have to go to a program and run those shops in order to get promoted. But man, it, it hurts. I'll tell you from from my side of it, as a guy that's been trying to get those codes on both sides of the fence on an ACC at the rescue and over an ST, it sucks mm-hmm. to watch somebody that you really like, you really connect with. Some of our best jump masters, by the way, and I want to talk about that here in a second is what's, what's some of the other stuff that you could do. Some of our best jump masters and flyers at the 2-2, the two that I'm thinking of are both riggers. Yeah. They're both guys that have gone through the AFE progression, you know, Blake and Sticky. Mm-hmm. Those guys outfly everybody at the unit and it's not close. Um, so having, you know, losing those dudes to career progression, um, when they're a valuable asset, it really sucks. Yeah, it really hurts. That's part of the career field though. Um, uh, you know, the highest you can probably get is master. Um, uh, it's really hard to go anywhere past that because you're not over operational support squadron or doing the big blue air force type thing. Um, but that's kind of, you know, the give and take, like, what kind of quality of life do you have? What kind of, what do you, what do you want to do with the rest of your career type thing? So, sure. Um, but hopefully they're going to fix that. Um, they just put in a, uh, uh, support superintendent, the swims position. Um, and that's, yep. a, that's an E8 yep. position that, uh, it is, that could be filled by a, uh, a rigor or any other support, um, uh, AFSC. So, you know, they're making avenues there and eventually we'll get some at ACC and, um, and all the match comms. So hopefully there'll be more opportunities in the future, but yeah, right now it's kind of hard, especially losing all of those guys. Like you said, sticky is probably one of the best riggers I've ever met as well. So, uh, yeah. Facts. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it is what it is. It's a, it's a big blue machine and, and, and change is slow and painful, but, uh, speaking of the future and, and things that you can do, uh, we, we always get these questions. Hey, like if I, if I join, you know, X, Y, Z career field, what, what certifications, what, how does this transfer to the civilian sector? And I know y'all, you know, pick up a whole bunch of skills and certs that, uh, you know, transfer over to the civilian sector. Can you uh, talk a little bit about those? Yeah. So, um, as far as being a, a parachute rigger, there's a FAA master rigger positions out with uh, any of the parachute companies. Um, I almost took one with Butler parachutes at my 10 year mark and decided to stay in, but, um, there are opportunities out there. Um, not as many as other career fields, but there are some out there. You can 
work with airlines and do their emergency equipment or, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, civilian positions within the military where you can just hop into if you wanted to do that, um, stuff like that. But Yeah, I mean, we, we always tell our guys, <clears throat> anybody that's joining our career fields, and I, I'm sure it's the same with you, like you can do anything when you get out, like especially mm-hmm. like if you're rolling around with GAST, like I know the, the, the hours that you guys put in mm-hmm. and, and you know, like, like Aaron said, like he turned around and you were there. It's like, Hey man, I just, we just ambushed you. Yeah. Like you guys are out there in the field doing everything with everybody. So like if, if you can live in that world, I would say that you can, you can do almost anything when you get out. Oh yeah, absolutely. For sure. So how, how long have you been in? If you don't mind my uh, March, I hit 19 years. So I'm getting close to retirement, man. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and, and of all the, Folks that you've worked with, why do you hate combat controllers the most? <laughs> God dang it. God dang it. No it was being professional. I'm sorry. <laughs> no comment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we love our flannel, our Harleys, and our tattoos. Oh, man. I'm completely distinct, just like every other motorcycle riding, heavy metal listening, scarlet headed guy in the Air Force. Completely distinct, and I'm my own person. Mm-hmm. So, man, Gabe. Thanks for coming on. I want to end with the same thing that we always end on, right? So we always ask the people that are listening to the podcast, hey, what would what would your, uh, you know, we ask the people that come on the podcast, what, what would your advice be, right? Like, what would you say to somebody that's getting in? I want you to take some time and just, what, what's, what's the greatest thing about being an AFE, you know, an AFE airman and a multi-capable airman focusing on, on the parachute packing American section of what it is that we do. What, what advice would you give to somebody that doesn't know what they want to do um, in the air force yet? Like how, how would you bring them into the AFE fold? I would tell them like, Hey, this is a really good, cool job. Um, if you don't want to be an operator or you want to support the operators uh, for one reason or another, like this is a great opportunity um, there aren't many people in the world who get to actually save pilots or save operators. And, and we're one of those, we're one of those career fields that gets to do that. So like, if you look at it from that point of view, I would say like, Hey, this is, this is the path for you. And this is the path you should take. Yeah. And, and Gabe, one thing that I wanted to hit on and I, sorry, I had to go take care of something real quick, but um, you had mentioned some earlier about uh, the guys wanting you around or they, they enjoy seeing you and coming around and, and that's how you were recruiting and stuff like that. But, but at the same time, like whether it's, whether it's PJs, SR, TACP, combat controllers, ASOS, RQS, STS, um, like one of the things that we want, and this is not just from, from AFE folks, this is from all of our special warfare mission support folks is that we want you around. So, you know, in the gym, if we're working out, like we like having you guys in there. We want you guys in there when we do monster mashes, like we want you on our team. We, it, the things that we do, we can't do without you in any of the AFSCs. Right. Yeah. So that, that, that teamwork, that, uh, brother and, (coughs) excuse me, that brother and sisterhood that we have, um, like we need it and it's, and it's extremely important to the success of the mission, whether it's in the, you know, the agile combat employment, whether it's in your, your typical global access, precision strike, personnel recovery, like we require all of those special warfare mission support, which is why it's one of the soft truths, mm-hmm. um, out of SOCOM. So, uh, thank you for what you do and thank you for all the other special warfare mission support yeah. po- folks out there because, um, you, you for sure have saved, maybe not you, but you know, special warfare mission sports folks have saved my life for sure. Numerous times. So I, I just have a lot of appreciation for all of you. Yeah. Thanks guys. We do it to, uh, try to make your guys' life easier and, you know, just help out any way we can. So yeah, thanks for what you guys do as well. As long as we keep the seer guys out of the gym, everybody's happy. Yeah, thank goodness. Nobody, exactly. They're always doing weird stuff. Like, I can't we, wait we to really have... We really hated on seer. <laughs> yeah, we really did. Yeah, it's really good. Man, Gabe, I want to say thanks as a guy that actually has had his life saved specifically by you and a shoot that you pack. Man, thanks for coming on. Thanks for talking about the goodness of AFB. Keep crushing it out there. 
everybody else that's still listening thanks for uh, for uh, following along the, the project leave your comments uh, in the comment section or get to a fight or do whatever y'all do down there it's usually a dumpster fire but it's a good thing to watch so go follow us over on ig you can hit any one of us up if you have any questions dm us we'll definitely get back to you go check out onesready.com you can find everywhere that we are to include every podcast we're over on discord and all that stuff's over at the website so Gabe, one more time. Thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. Everybody else out there, train hard. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.